information. And that's your one time to get your message across and tell them how important everything is. It's not the time to get on the phone and be all you know, scared and silly and all that stuff. If that's the case, then don't run. That's what I would tell people, quite frankly. Yes? Um, do you find it easier with candidates that you work with who have spent like, their entire lives fundraising for different activities and they may have been involved in? Are they sure. less nervous or do they really Less nervous, them? have more contacts. It comes down to how many contacts, again, our universe. How many folks do you know? Have you raised money before? A great candidate is somebody that's been very active in their community, um, who's, who's been in philanthropic things, who's been a real fabric of the community. Um, you know, a, a, a Chewy Hinojosa is a state senator in the Valley. He's lived there his whole life. He went, went and fought in Vietnam when he was 18 years old, went off, became a lawyer, you know, rose from very humble beginnings, spent his whole life doing good works, okay? So when he turns around and asks people to help him, it's a whole lot easier. <laughs> Right? than someone that's moved around the country and decided to be an insurance agent here. And after four years, I'm going to run for office. Well, that person doesn't know anybody. They haven't done anything. They might have tried to em embroider themselves in the community, if you will, but not really. It's hard. You know, Donna Howard, 58 years old, spent her whole life as a nurse, as a teacher, a school board member, you know, having her kids slumber parties at their house, et cetera, et cetera, and participating in her community. It's a whole lot easier to go to people in her community to ask them for help. So absolutely is the answer. Yes. Jeff, can you talk a little bit about the career of fundraising? Because I know a lot of us who do fundraising have tripped into it accidentally. Um, but in politics, I know it can be a very profitable career. Because <laughs> a lot of people don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say, in my opinion, and, and others can tell you different, that the fundraising part is the most stressful because the candidate's constantly calling you and saying, we're not having enough success, we're not raising enough money, and you tend to give them the same advice over and over. Are you making the calls? Are you working the target list in order? You know, are you off the reservation calling you know, lawyers in Tulsa? You know, you'll see that. You know, so it's always, it, it ends up becoming somewhat fundamental, simple advice over and over, and it becomes frustrating from, from the perspective of folks like me sometimes that you're telling them the same thing over and over and what the candidate's really saying to you when they keep asking is, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it another way. And there really isn't another way. So it's, it's, I would first say about the fundraising, quote, career, it's very tough. It's stressful. You have to have an inside that lets you let some of that go. Um, and it, you know, can run through you a little bit. I always, at the end of an even year, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of happy. I'm not going to have any five months of fundraising calls or a couple months at least of no fundraising calls at, you know, all hours of the day. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough job. On the flip side, you know, I was a 22-year-old uh, finance director to the sitting lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania running for governor. I got to sit there with this man for 18 months, and I spent literally every minute with him. I had more time with the candidate than anyone else. Um, I got to know him better than anyone else. Um, I spent every minute of the day with him. I know Pennsylvania to this day better than I know my home state of Ohio or Texas or anywhere. You know, I've been to every county in Pennsylvania. It was a 19-month odyssey, and we were bonded at the hip, and we raised $10 million, and it was extremely um, gratifying. It was, it was a great experience. Um, I was important to the candidate. I was important to the campaign. People let me do my job because they, they knew how hard it was, and, you know, I got to swim in my own lane. A lot of times in a campaign, you know, the press person wants to tell you to do this, or the field person wants to tell you how to talk to Louie at, you know, at the bar, and that's not their job necessarily. In fundraising, you get to swim in your own lane, and if you're successful at it, you can do really well, um, you can, and you can always be employed. The coolest part that I figured out real quick, I'm from a small town in Ohio, and I realized that I didn't want to go back to Ohio and be a lawyer, doctor, insurance, whatever. I wanted to go off and do politics. Well, how could I do that? Well, the first thing I learned was campaigns hire people all the time. And the first person they hire, or typically the first person they hire, is a finance person. And so you become the most employable if you do finance or fundraising. You become the most employable, the most valuable, if you will, over that longer term stretch of the life of a campaign. You know, if you just do field or, or whatever else, or you're a press secretary, maybe you get in the last few months or six months or however it works. Or if you're, uh, you know, doing a job like that, you have this much involvement. You know, if you're raising money, you know, we had in that case example I gave you in Pennsylvania, I was there in, oh yeah, sorry. I was there in May of 93, and the campaign was in November of 94. 
okay? And we opened the campaign office. I mean, I was the first dude there. Um, so it was really cool to be on there, on the campaign from Jump Street. Um, but it was also hard, and I was, you know, there's a lot of stress involved, and the campaign manager's calling you every day and saying, you know, what'd you get in pledges today? What's going on? Da 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 da. Um, and it's the same kind of drill. If you then end up being becoming a consultant and you deal with the client or the candidate, you know, same kind of thing. I end up, well, how much did you get in pledges today? You know, you end up running through a lot of these same fundamentals. And a lot of good fundraising is simply staying on the fundamentals and not getting off in the weeds with, you know, I'm going to raise it on the blogs or I'm going to raise it in pig pickings. You know, it's focus, focus. You only have a short time and you got to ask people for money. Yes? So did you get like 20% of the 10 million? No, and it's criminal. I don't know how they do it on the Republican side. Um, so if anybody does this way, I'm not trying to offend them. But when you look at a campaign, and, and James will talk about this. You got 100% of your budget, okay? You want, what you, what you want to do is spend 70, or if you can, 80% on communication, on having a conversation with the voters, on telling them your message, okay? So, if, so that's what you want to do with most of the money, and then you got 15% on polling and research, and 15% maybe on staff and consultants and the like. But essentially, a campaign, you want to take all that money and just put it into communication, because that's the point of having it. So if you take a percentage off of what you do, what you raise, right? You know, you're already killing X percent. You know, I hear this commonly. Well, how about you take 15 percent? No, no, it's just not right. That's what I think. No, I charge a fee. <laughs> no, oh no, 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 no. I charge a monthly fee, and what you're trying to do is reach a point where the monthly fee is reasonable and affordable for what you're giving them. And, that, and what's important is as you work through that process, if, it, if they don't want to do it the way you want to do it, then you've got to be steel enough inside to say, look, it's just not going to work. And it's tricky. You know, when I first got into this business, I think sometimes I would charge, you know, I can think of two clear examples where I charge too much, and I can think two, two or three clear examples where I charge too little. So it's a feel thing, and it's hard, and you're not, you know, you get, you're not always going to get it right. Just do your best and guesstimate. I mean, if you're, if you're getting down that road and you want to work in a finance position, I could, you know, um, you can email me or whatever. I can tell you what it's worth, to be honest, depending on what size race you're doing. But it's most important, what's the size of the budget? Because if you're the finance director, you should only take out, you know, 1% or less than 1% or whatever it is of the overall budget, you know, hopefully. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, that's a much longer answer. It depends what kind of pack it is. Uh, it depends what the issue is. It depends on a lot of things. And I'd also tell you that pack and group fundraising is some of the hardest fundraising out there. Um, and so a common bait and switch is, well, I'll give you a job raising my pack money. You can have a percentage, and you're sitting there thinking all this money you're going to make. And four weeks down the road, you're like, how am I going to pay the rent? Now, maybe that's not the situation, but I'm just saying I've seen it. So be careful. And I, again, I think determine what your work what, what your work is worth, and be willing to, to to ask for it. Okay, that's what I think. And I think that's it. I think we're over, folks. So let's move along and keep them on schedule. Are there any other? Great. you might be able to see him again a little bit later at Schultz's if right. you've got questions you might want to approach him then a small oh, token thank of you thank you thank you very much thanks for having